Chapter 21 Barbara, over here. Gwen waved to her red-headed friend from the restaurant booth she was seated at. Barbara returned the wave and made her way over to the table and slid in while a waitress stopped by with a menu. The redhead quickly placed an order for a drink before returning her greeting. Gwen, I'm surprised you wanted to meet up like this, she said, referring to them both being out in public and not in costume. I just needed to unwind a bit. Do something normal, you know? Gwen shrugged. After her encounter the other night, she had reached out hoping to meet up and trade notes, but she wanted to spend some time out of her mask. She liked going out as Ghost Spider, but lately that seemed to be all she was doing. The only connection Gwen had left to her civilian life was occasionally answering an email from Wayne Entertainment about expansions to her game or maybe developing a new one. Yeah, yeah, I do. Barbara sighed, slouching forward onto the table. We haven't made any progress on our project and it's making everyone tense. Something I can help with? Barbara instantly shook her head negatively. Not really. We've basically gone over everything we have at the moment and have gotten nowhere. Dick and Tim are still looking, though. Maybe they'll get lucky? Anyways, you've been a great help patrolling the streets. We wouldn't have been able to be as thorough investigating without you helping. Gwen swallowed her bitter feelings about that and turned the conversation to lighter topics for now. While she was happy she was helping out, and she didn't mind stopping people from getting hurt on the streets at all, she still didn't like being treated like a second-string hero. At the same time, she couldn't exactly complain and invite herself into what was essentially someone else's home just because she wanted to know more. The waitress came back, and they placed their orders, content to talk about mundane things even after their food arrived. The two girls wandered from topic to topic as they ate. A book Barbara had just finished that Gwen had read a while back, what the police were doing after the Falcone fiasco, short-term plans for the future. Eventually, the topic of Gwen's game came up and Barbara couldn't hold back a question that had been bugging her for a bit. Hey, Gwen. I wanted to ask, why are you trying to be a hero? The blonde paused mid-bite and raised an eyebrow. Why do you ask? She said instead of an answer. It's been bothering me a bit. It made sense in hindsight that you wanted to get back at the ones who targeted you, Dad, but after that you just kept going. Barbara frowned. I mean, I get wanting to help out, but you almost died and went back to patrolling like it was nothing almost the very next day. Gwen took a sip of her drink to give herself more time to think about it. A part of her was itching to use the classic, with great power comes great responsibility speech, but she felt like she would be cheapening it somehow. As she was right now, she didn't fully believe in that mentality, even if she respected it. Sure, she had the memories of someone who lived by that code and had seen other spiders do similar, but those people weren't her. So why did Gwen keep on being Ghost Spider? The depressingly honest answer was she didn't have much else left to do. College wouldn't accept her back until the next term, and as generous as the contract with Wayne Enterprises was, it wasn't going to let her pay her way through for some time. And using the money she stole from the mafia was just asking to get investigated by someone. She didn't really have many friends outside of school due to her need to keep her grades at the top of the class. And she wasn't really able to get a job she would enjoy without a degree. Sure, she could keep trying her hand as a game designer, but just like any job that wouldn't occupy her 100% of the time. Despite that, Gwen didn't want any pity, so instead she decided to talk about a less honest, but still true reason she liked being a hero. I guess it's because I like the feeling of knowing I'm helping get the worst of the scum off the streets. The worst? Barbara parroted, looking alarmed. I don't mean the most dangerous or anything like that, the blonde clarified. I mean the kind of criminals you and the others tend to pass over. The drug dealers, muggers, petty thieves, guys that slip under the radar because they are too small time to be worth the effort. We go after them too. Barbara said defensively, a bit heated too. I never said you didn't, Gwen raised her hands placatingly. But you also focus on the things the police can't solve themselves first. I'm not saying that you would ignore something like that happening in front of you, but if it's a choice between a drug dealer and a crime family, you tend to focus on the latter first. Stolen novel. Please report. That's Dash. Not a bad thing. She spoke over her friend. I get it. Only so many hours in the day and even your preppy cheerleader friend can't be everywhere. So keep doing it. 
Keep focusing on the big problems in the city. In the meantime, I think I'll start looking for the things you missed. Preppy cheerleader, the redhead scoffed. I think Kara would blow a gasket if you called her that to her face. You can tell her I said it if you get me a picture. Gwen teased. Don't tempt me, but you said missed. Unless you're still talking about the stuff from the fiasco, that means you found something else. Gwen sighed and matched Barbara's serious mane. Yeah, I think I might have. See, last night, she went on to explain everything she saw at the drug deal and about the modified venom. This wasn't something she was going to investigate without at least warning the other heroes something was going on. By the end of it, Barbara leaned back and slowly let out a breath. Damn, how did we miss? No, we've seen an uptick of venom dens lately. They must have been flooding the streets with the old stuff to hide moving the new product in. The commissioner's daughter was quick to figure out what was going on. Okay, I'll. Whatever she was going to say was cut off by a ringtone going off. Barbara reached into a pocket for her phone, looked at the message briefly, and scowled. Whatever she had just been told must have annoyed her. Bad news? Bad timing, she gave Gwen a complicated look. The boys actually got lucky. A robbery matching the ones here was just reported by a friend of ours in Star City. Someone just stole some unstable isotopes from a research lab. We have a lead on the mastermind, but two of us are probably going to need to go there and one stay in the cave to coordinate everything. She chewed her lip in frustration. I don't know if we can help. Hey, don't worry about it, Gwen shrugged, not letting her disappointment show. If whoever is behind this is going after stuff like that, it isn't going to be for something small. Definitely more important than some drug pushers. I'll figure something out in the meantime. No, I can't just leave you hanging like that. Especially when I asked for your help in the first place. Barbara instantly denied. We might not be able to help directly this time, but I'll set you up with a communicator with some access to our systems. It should save you some time investigating and give you a direct line to us if you find something. Oh, that was much more helpful than Gwen had been expecting. Honestly, when she heard that there was an issue in another city, she had been half expecting to be told there was nothing they could do and she was on her own. At least this way, she had someone to contact if she started getting in over her head again. That would be great, she said with a relieved smile. By some unspoken agreement, the two girls turned back to mundane topics for the rest of their meal, enjoying the time they had to relax before they would need to focus on the upcoming investigations. Oh! Once Barbara split from Gwen, having given her a spare communicator she kept in a hidden stash for moments like this one, she made her way back to the cave as fast as she could. The message she had gotten had been deliberately light on details, but it hinted at a bigger issue. When she got there, she was greeted by both Dick and Tim huddled around the main computer in plain clothes, going over some technical manual Barbara couldn't make heads or tails of. Something to do with geo-resonance. Hey guys, what's going on? The two boys turned to look at her and Barbara noticed Dick seemed more stressed than the last time she saw him. Barbara, thanks for making it back so fast. We have a problem. More than an unknown mind controller committing robberies across the country? She asked. Yes, we think we figured out what the robberies are for. He turned around and scrolled to the top of the document. The Markov device. An experimental device capable of creating artificial earthquakes meant to be used for wide-scale demolition work and earth flattening that was scrapped when the environmental effects were considered too damaging for real use. It was decommissioned and the main components sent to Wayne Tech for further research. The same components that went missing in the last robberies. Barbara let out a breath. My God, what would anyone even use it for? Tim snorted. If we're lucky, they just want a quick way to level some backcountry land. If not, they would have a weapon that could raise a city in an afternoon. Dick said gravely. Which is why we're teaming up with KF, MM, and Speedy to make sure we catch them before they can use it. Those were really good choices for backup. Kid Flash would make sure nothing short of teleportation would let the bad guys slip away, Miss Martian would hopefully counter any mind control, and was powerful enough to be a trump card against heavy hitters, and speedy new Star City like the back of his hand. With one person staying behind as support, that would be a pretty solid five-man team. But one thing was bothering Barbara. The Justice League isn't trying to take over? 
It had been a big friction point between many of the sidekicks and their mentors over the past couple years. The older heroes wanted to shield them from the bigger and more dangerous things required of the job, while the younger ones wanted to take more on. It had gotten easier now that many of them were older, but every once in a while it would pop up again. No one's available to try, Dick said shortly. Superman and Wonder Woman are busy with a flood that hit a town. GL is off-planet. Flash is tracking down an arms dealer selling some alien tech, and the rest have their own things to look after. It went unspoken that any of the other League members simply didn't have the right to order them to do anything. What about Bruce? He's being super mysterious again and disappeared. Tim muttered. At least this time he sent us a note. Barbara saw Dick clench his jaw and nod. He told us he's investigating something and needed to go dark for a bit. Which is why I'll stay behind and keep an eye on Gotham. The redhead nodded, realizing why Dick seemed more stressed. Batman didn't leave Gotham to other people. At least he didn't until now. Hey, should we ask the spider chick to help us with this? Tim asked suddenly. She stood up to Supergirl for a bit. It'd be nice to have another heavy hitter with us. Trying to spend more time with a cute blonde? Barbara teased, trying to ease the tension in the room. Making Tim flush Scarlet was just a bonus. No, I mean yes. I mean... I thought it would be a good opportunity to introduce her to the rest of the heroes our age. The younger teen stammered. Not a good idea. Dick swiftly undercut that option. This is too important for a meet and greet. We've never really worked with her, and this mission is going to require perfect teamwork. If we slip up, it won't just be us paying the price. Barbara sighed as the tense atmosphere quickly returned. She might not have joined anyway. She has her own investigation going on right now. She filled both of them in on what Gwen had told her. An improved version of Venom that had fewer drawbacks but didn't last as long. And someone was going to be using them for at least one underground fight ring. Gwen was still looking into the source to see where the rest could be sent off to. So I gave her a spare communicator and asked her to keep us up to date. She finished her recap of her lunch conversation. Good work. Dick complimented after a few seconds of silence. I'll try reaching out to her and figuring out how we can help. Both Tim and Barbara had surprised expressions after that. Good work? Weren't you just ranting about how she could be some kind of plant yesterday? Tim asked incredulously. And she still could be. Dick shot back. But keeping people safe is more important. And if she isn't a plant, we're going to need to work with her. This way we at least know what she's up to. Barbara sighed at her friend's continued paranoia but didn't say anything. It would be counterproductive at the moment. She just hoped working together would mend the bridges between Dick and Gwen a bit. She was starting to tire of needing to sidestep them avoiding each other. Chapter 22 With half the heroes out of the city for the moment, Ghost Spider was half expecting there to be a huge upswing of crime that she would need to deal with. Of course, since the heroes themselves didn't exactly scream from the rooftops that they were leaving, that didn't happen. If anything... Petty crime was down for the moment now that it was clear Ghost Spider wasn't another thief joining the long list of rogues looking to enhance her reputation by playing in Batman's backyard and was actually another vigilante looking to clear out Gotham streets. It would likely pick back up again once the more analytical criminals figured out where she liked to patrol and how long she was active. Naturally, she would do her best to mix things up now and then to make sure no one could accurately track her, but the bad guys dedicated or wealthy enough could and would spare no effort if it meant they got away clean. Speaking of criminals, Ghost Spider was busy tracking down the supplier of her two friends in the alley and finding out where he got his goods. Marcus, real name Eustace Gaylord, was the manager of a small shipping company when he wasn't moonlighting as a drug dealer. He was fairly unremarkable in just about every regard, looks, lifestyle, talent. Just about the only thing he seemed to have that wasn't utterly average was his ambition to have everyone follow his orders. And when his lack of legitimate business talent and connections prevented him from moving up in his company, he branched out to other means. Ghost Spider was learning a lot about Eustace these days. And thanks to her little connection to the back computer, so was Nightwing. The two of them weren't quite back on talking terms, but they also weren't avoiding each other at the moment. Though truthfully, Ghost Spider had less impersonal, professionally polite conversations with her cable service than she did with Batman's protege. 
A necessary sacrifice to get access to the multitude of backdoored systems the hero team had available, such as the city traffic cameras. Eustace hid his operations well enough for a casual inspection, but with the back computer following him throughout the city, Ghost Spider had the location of the heart of his drug operation in no time. A nice little office building and garage technically owned by the company he worked for, but in reality was purely a front for storing his illegal product. Between him, the five permanent workers in the building, and his small horde dealers it was no wonder Eustace was able to supply a new version of Venom to underground fight rings. The man had managed to create one of the largest drug rings in the city that Nightwing was aware of, and from the sound of it, he was still looking to expand. That wasn't what Ghost Spider was here for, though. As she silently slipped into Eustace's third-floor office while the man was doing something elsewhere, she pulled out a USB dongle Batgirl had given her and plugged it into the drug pusher's computer. The little wireless device allowed the Batcave direct access to whatever it was plugged into and, by extension, the many different hacking tools available there. Ghost Spider to Batcave, I'm plugged in. Anyone there or am I on my own? She was hoping that Nightwing had stepped out for a minute or Alfred had taken over, but when she heard her estranged friend's voice, she realized she wasn't quite that lucky. Nightwing here, I'm pulling the files now. Should be five minutes to get the source locations if they're on his machine. Which meant Ghost Spider had to hang out in an office alone on an awkward phone call while she waited for the download to finish. Fantastic, this was going to be like that tech support job in high school all over again. So any news about what the others are up to? She asked after a little while in an attempt to break the silence. They have everything under control. Nightwing said shortly, smothering the conversation before it even began. Ghost Spider felt a surge of annoyance building as, once again, Nightwing was being a dick and refusing to actually talk to her. She waited until a slight beep from the dongle let her know Nightwing had cut the connection to the computer. He must have gotten everything he could already, and pulled the device before slipping it back into a discreet pocket. Anything interesting? She asked while she snuck a peek out the window. Eustace and a group of his workers were all heading towards the garage. Give me a minute. Some of the locations match locations we've already taken care of. I'm cross-checking those now. When Nightwing didn't say anything else, Ghost Spider stretched before opening the window and climbing out. Well, while you do that, I'm gonna go say hi to the owner. You mind calling the GCPD to pick them up for me? Thanks. If you find the story on Amazon, be aware that it has been stolen. Please report the infringement. Wait, what? Ghost Spider snapped the communicator closed and when it immediately began buzzing, muted it. All right, let's go take care of the trash. The spider-themed hero didn't bother with stealth at this point. In fact, she boldly walked into the garage like she belonged there and made no attempt to hide herself as she walked up behind the group that entered earlier. Eustace, or perhaps it should be Marcus now that he was in his dealer persona, was handing out orders for deliveries to his smaller-scale dealers. Ghost Spider listened in just in case one of those locations hadn't been on his computer, but when it seemed like Marcus was finishing up she prepared to announce her presence, only to be interrupted by a trilling ringtone coming from her communicator. The drug dealers all started panicking when they noticed the black and white figure behind them, but Ghost Spider calmly retrieved her communicator, flipped it open, and set it to speaker. If Nightwing was going to go through the effort of taking the device off mute, she might as well answer him. Illo, the GCPD is on the way, Nightwing said sourly, and all of the drug pushers close enough to hear paled. One looked like he was going to be sick. Did you catch them all, or do they need to be on the lookout for runners? Ghost Spider was carefully watching the criminals. Most of them seemed like office types that had never run a day in their life if they could help it besides the few that looked like they had a clue when it came to a fight. Even those didn't look thrilled at their chances. In a fight or otherwise? Nope, I haven't even gotten started yet. Nightwing misunderstood and sighed in relief. Good, just leave them for the police. If the other drug rings realize we are looking into them, they'll panic. As long as no one sees you there, we can pass it off as a police raid. We'll about that? Ghost Spider scratched her cheek awkwardly. You're on speaker so now they all know. Why? You turned on the ringer and called me when I was right behind them. What's the point in being sneaky at that point? You, stop standing around and get her you idiots. 
Marcus finally recovered his wits at finding a superhero right behind him in the middle of his highly illegal operation and decided to order his lackeys to distract her while he tried to escape. Unfortunately for him, instead of his shouts spurring them into doing what he said more than half started running for the exit along with him. The rest actually tried to attack her. Whether out of loyalty or desperation was up for debate, though. What were you expecting? It's not like they wouldn't have noticed a ringtone going off anyway. Ghost Spider chided, ducking around the haphazard punches of the drug dealers and focusing on the ones running away. I was expecting you to have finished or stayed out of sight. How was I supposed to know you would walk right up to them? Most of the fleeing criminals were quickly wrapped up by Ghost Spider's webs. The few that were lucky enough to dodge or hide behind one of the others at first were thrown into the garage walls and stuck there when Ghost Spider used considerably more force to trap them. Marcus got some special treatment after he threw one of his employees into the path of one of the webs and was wrapped up completely. Ghost Spider even webbed his mouth shut when he started screaming obscenities. That's not the important part. You should have realized I was busy when I muted the line, not blasted noise to anyone nearby. The few people left uncaptured had practically given up fighting her properly. When every punch kick or thrown object was easily dodged, one of them desperately tried to tackle Ghost Spider. However, she simply jumped over his attempt and kicked off his shoulder in the process, sending the man face first into the floor. Anyways, I'm going to finish up. I'll give you a call when I'm done so we can discuss your highly unprofessional attitude. You're Callie. Ghost Spider interrupted him again by closing the communicator and turned to the last three people standing. So now that you have my full attention, you guys ready to begin? She asked, raising her fists. Two of them looked at each other and by some unspoken signal, charged. One going low, the second going high in a last-ditch effort to overpower the metahuman. Ghost Spider wasn't really feeling interested in a wrestling match, though, so she lowered one fist and shot a blob of webbing onto the first man's foot, tripping both him and the man behind him. Once both of them were tangled together on the floor, Ghost Spider simply webbed both of them and looked at the last one remaining. She couldn't help but feel a little bored at this whole bust, but that was what she got by expecting anything from office jockeys. The last man was even the stereotypical balding fat guy that seemed to be in every office. And considering how much he was shaking, he wasn't secretly some kind of secret weapon. I don't want to go to jail, he cried even as he sank to his knees and raised his hands. And I don't want people selling dangerous drugs to kids. Ghost Spider snarked back. Guess we both are disappointed tonight. Oh! The police eventually arrived and took all the drug pushers away. As the last of them was pushed into the back of a van, Ghost Spider gave all the officers a cheerful wave and took off, even the one officer that looked like he would rather arrest her than deal with the drug dealers. Too bad that meant she no longer had a reason to delay calling Nightwing back again. So even though she wasn't really willing, Ghost Spider pulled out her communicator one more time and called the Batcave. Finally finished then? Ghost Spider smirked over Nightwing's pouting tone, even if he tried to hide it. Yup, one major drug distribution circle dealt with. And with plenty of info to start scoping out some more. For all the good it will do us. You realize most of his suppliers are just going to stop working out of the locations we found once they hear about this right. But it will force them to stop shipping to other dealers for a while. Ghost Spider argued. Plus it's not like you aren't setting up monitoring on them right now to see where they run off to. Nightwing growled but didn't refute that he was spying on the locations he could. You're being reckless. If you had just waited, we could have set it up so the GCPD could have helped us secure all the sites at once. With what people? Most of the ones the commissioner can trust are still out on injury. I think it's better to throw a wrench into their operations and track them down later than wait till you get a perfect scenario. You think they have a bigger plan in the works? Nightwing must have picked up on her concerns. Yeah. I don't like that the first we're hearing about a new and improved Venom is through street-level dealers. Ghost Spider sighed. I think this is either a distraction or a setup for something big we weren't supposed to figure out yet. Because we focus on bigger criminals than drug dealers, Nightwing muttered, thinking out loud. Talked to Batgirl about that recently? Ghost Spider hoped he didn't take it the wrong way. She genuinely understood that the Bat family had to prioritize. 
Cleaning up the city streets didn't matter too much when every public official would let them walk because they could be bought slash bribed slash blackmailed or some other reason they were little better than the criminals that were caught. We talked. Nightwing admitted. Fine. If this is how you want to play it, go ahead. I'll back you up when I can. Do you plan on going to another location tonight? I can give the police a heads up so they aren't surprised. Nah, I've got other plans for the rest of the night. They should be able to handle a few of Mr. Gaylord's friends on their own. Ghost Spider was inwardly relieved that Nightwing was at least starting to talk to her like a friend again and not a subject to be interrogated or holding her at an emotional distance. Maybe by the time Batgirl was done with whatever she was up to, all three of them would be able to talk again without things getting awkward for once. Somehow she doubted it would be that simple, but hope springs eternal and all that jazz. Pushing those thoughts out of her mind for the moment, Ghost Spider started swinging back into the city. She had a patrol to finish and a tub of chocolate ice cream with her name on it waiting at home. Chapter 23 The problem with Gotham weather was that rain came in two flavors. A dreary light mist that was tolerable as long as you didn't mind everything being damp, and a downpour that a fish would find fairly comfortable if they found themselves out of the river for whatever reason. A sudden storm that would cause any sane person to seek shelter rolled in practically overnight, and unfortunately, rain checks for bad weather didn't often apply to superhero work. So Ghost Spider was stuck on a roof overlooking an old brick factory that had supposedly been shut down for over three years, doing her best to not drown on land. Thankfully, her symbiote suit could shift to be completely water repellent, so she wasn't as miserable as she could be. She was still miserable, of course. But now she was only a 7 out of 10 on the scale rather than a full 10. The spider-themed metahuman wasn't about to leave, though. The factory had been one of the few places that had not been frantically abandoned after the police swung by to pick up Mr. Gaylord and his friends. Unlike the others, it stayed active even after the GCPD visited three times. Nightwing had kept her updated on each site as an apology for the ringtone incident. It turns out the shortcut to activate the speaker is one key off from just making it vibrate, and had fed her that information when it was clear something fishy was going on. So now Ghost Spider was staking out the place waiting for the person Nightwing assumed was in charge to show. But after another hour of getting rained on, her patience was at an end. All right, that's it. If no one shows in 10 minutes, I'm busting the place anyway, she declared to the world. Not even five minutes later, a sleek black car pulled up and a man rushed into the building. Ghost Spider simply blinked at the sudden development and cocked an eye skyward. Huh, any chance of the rain letting up? She asked rhetorically. If anything, the rain picked up for a second, and a sudden wind pushed a sheet of water directly into her face. Yeah, didn't think so. She sputtered before making a leap off the roof towards the factory. Oh! Getting inside unnoticed took a bit of finesse to avoid leaving a massive puddle of water, but she managed it. The last thing she wanted was these people scattering into the city. It would be hard to round them all up on a normal night, Never mind the current downpour. The rain wasn't all bad news, though. The constant dull roar of water falling on the roof masked any sounds made by the rusting catwalks overhead as Ghost Spider moved invisibly to observe the main floor. A dozen men in protective gear were carefully mixing vats of chemicals or operating machines that spit out lines of injectors filled with a nearly glowing green liquid or loading boxes with the stuff. Clearly this was a major venom production plant, and the owner had someone deep in their pocket if they could keep operating this openly even after a major drug ring was busted and in the process of getting cleaned up. She made a note to let Nightwing know when she talked to him next. This might be the loose thread that let them take out another corrupt official. Actually, why wait? Ghost Spider pulled out her communicator and sent the original Boy Wonder a message letting him know about the factory along with several pictures. That should be enough to force the police to act even with whatever backer this group was hiding behind. So she was a little surprised when Nightwing called her, thankfully without a ringtone, almost immediately after. Hey Nightwing, kinda in the middle of something. Can we talk later? She asked in a whisper. Stolen from Royal Road, this story should be reported if encountered on Amazon. This won't take long. I'd send a message, but you need to hear this. He replied grimly. That probably meant nothing good. This have something to do with what the others left to deal with? It does. 
they left to help track down something called the Markov device. It's a dash, an experimental device that operates on some really advanced principles of georesonance, originally meant to assist in land development. There were some really interesting articles about it when they released the idea, but I was more interested in the vibrational insulation they used to stop the thing from shaking itself apart. Those dampeners were some of the most, not the point. I thought it was shut down. Ghost Spider caught herself before she continued to give a speech about the mechanics involved. She couldn't help it, though. Technology had always been a passion for her. Nightwing was silent for a few seconds before sighing. Right, forgot who I was talking to. Of course you would know about something like that. Only you would read those articles for fun. I resent the implication. Ghost Spider sniffed, then grew serious. But I doubt you decided to bring up a scrapped experiment for no reason. Someone stole the tech to make one. You're right, I'm not. The mastermind behind the thefts was Gorilla Grodd. He wanted to use the device to systematically level the biggest cities in America, but we managed to catch him before he could get it running. While that was the good news, Ghost Spider was willing to bet there was a complication, though, because Nightwing didn't sound like everything had been wrapped up. The problem is Grodd wasn't the one to build the device. That we discovered was Malcolm Merlin, former CEO and partner of Brian Markov. He agreed to build Grodd's device as long as he was able to keep the prototype for himself. So he could get revenge on the people who ruined his life. And there it was. So there's another device out there? Sounds bad, but what's that got to do with me? Merlin listed three cities he wanted left alone. New York, Metropolis, and Gotham. We think he wanted to hit those cities personally, so we put the word out to all heroes we're in contact with. You have a habit of digging up information, so I wanted you to know in case you managed to stumble onto it. Nightwing, I appreciate the sudden confidence. I really do. But this needs more than a handful of people looking for it. Please tell me we aren't the only ones looking. Ghost Spider hissed into the communicator. At the same time, the man she saw earlier walked into the main floor having an argument with someone over the phone. Ghost Spider had intended to catch him alone if possible, but a city-destroying earthquake generator was a tiny bit more important. We have the GCPD looking everywhere they can. Nightwing assured her. We won't have to sweep the city by ourselves. That also means the most they will be able to do about your drug factory is send a wagon for pickup. That's fine. All I needed, really. I'll let you know when they are all wrapped up and ready for a ride. The wall crawler joked half-heartedly. The call ended and she looked down at the floor again. Most of the men had stopped what they were doing to listen in on their boss yelling into his own phone, though it looked like whatever conversation he was having was winding down. He spat one final insult into his phone before snapping it closed and glaring at it like he was considering throwing it into a wall. A second later, he almost regretfully put it into a pocket instead and waved to those watching to stop whatever they were doing. All right, boys, if you couldn't guess, that was our customer. He's not going to cough up extra to cover transport costs since Marcus got pinched and he still wants his stock on the same date. Fuck him, though. I'm burning favors like crazy keeping the cops from stopping by and the money promised isn't worth it. Finish up the last batch, then pack it up. We'll sit on what we have until another buyer lines up. Huh, another business type boss. Ghost Spider had been running into quite a few of them lately. She had been expecting crazier since, you know, Gotham, but she was fine taking down assholes that were fine with ruining people's lives for a buck. So with the grace an Olympic gymnast would be jealous of, Ghost Spider jumped off the catwalk, twisting as Thwip, 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 Asterisk, Asterisk, Thwip, Asterisk, Asterisk, Thwipity, Asterisk, Asterisk, Thwip, Asterisk. She spun fast enough to web each man on the way down before landing in a crouch on top of one of the machines. Points for realizing making drugs for a jackass boss is a bad idea. Minus points for making the drugs in the first place, assholes. Now why don't you all just relax while we wait for some nice men and women from the GCPD to come give you some nice new bracelets to try on? Damn it. Fucking asshole said he was keeping attention off us, the boss complained. No way we should be getting attention from masks. Ghost Spider shrugged. Maybe he was. The problem with that is I had the original list. Doesn't take a genius to see no one stopping by and figure something isn't right. 
but if you give me a name, I'll see if I can swing it so that he gets the cell right next to yours so you can complain in person. She offered. Heh, <laughs> swing it. Cause you swing from webs. One of the others laughed. See, he gets it. Ghost Spider pointed at the man with an eye smile, but internally she was getting cautious. None of the men seemed to be panicked about suddenly being covered in sticky white silk. That meant they were either too stupid to realize they were in trouble, or they were confident they could deal with this anyway. One person being that stupid was acceptable. Everyone here, including the boss who just backed out of a job he decided wasn't worth the heat? Much less likely. Jacob? Shut up. Said boss snapped. And you, girly, I'll give you one chance to leave and forget you saw this or we dump you in a back alley. I'm not in the mood to play with some vigilante. You're pretty confident for guys that are already tied up. Whatever, I gave you a chance. The boss sighed. Boys, take her down. Ghost Spider frowned at the seemingly delusional command before she heard a slight hissing sound coming from the closest henchman. It sounded kind of familiar, almost like. She didn't finish that thought as every single one of them bulked up like someone had injected helium into a balloon and easily tore out of the silk strands holding them. One winced uncomfortably and yanked something away from his collar. It was a tiny automatic injector with something green dripping from the tip. Oh! If you were worried about people taking you to jail and had access to a super steroid, it made sense they would have it prepared as a last resort. And now Ghost Spider was surrounded by a dozen enhanced goons with super strength. And unlike her friend from the alley, it was clear these guys were used to the effects and knew how to fight. Well then. Chapter 24. Chapter 24. Surrounded by knockoff Bane wannabes and all alone, there was one thing Ghost Spider had to ask. So does ripping out of your clothes like that hurt? Don't they reinforce the seams so they specifically don't do that? One of the men scowled. Yeah, pinches like crazy for a few seconds, and then the outfit is scrap afterwards. Ouch, do your bosses at least pay for those? Nope. In fact, dash. Jacob. Shut. Up. The boss cut in. Talk on your own time. I want to be out of here ASAP. Yeah, yeah. Ghost Spider's spider sense flared a warning, and she jumped off the machine she was perched on to avoid a pipe one of the men had thrown at her. The jerk had used the rain and his buddy's voice to cover up his movement to try and get a free hit in. Hey, rude. Not in this business because I'm polite. And don't really care about the opinion of a dead girl, came the growled reply. Just get her already. Two guys charged her from separate directions and Ghost Spider decided the best way to handle that for now was to backflip over a punch and land in a handstand on the other guy's shoulders. A quick kick to the back sent the second guy crashing forward into the first. They went down in an awkward crash of limbs before she webbed them together. They might be strong enough to break the webs, but it would slow them down, especially if they wound up working against each other. That did, unfortunately, put Ghost Spider in the middle of the rest of the goons. They didn't hesitate to rush her all at once. The heroine ducked under, around, over, and just about every other direction to avoid getting punched, kicked, or grabbed, but she made sure the other guys were feeling it when she had an opportunity with punches and kicks of her own. She also made sure to web them in the face every once in a while. Sudden blindness was good for distracting people. The main problem was, she had no idea how hard she could punch these people before she did some major damage. So she was slowly hitting harder and harder, but in the meantime, she wasn't exactly putting the Bane imitators out of the fight for more than a few seconds to shake themselves off. She's one girl. How is this taking so long? Maybe I'm just that good? That or that Venom stuff isn't as good as you think. One of the two. Ghost Spider taunted. Then she got caught in a feint that let one of the goons plant his fit in her jaw and sent her flying through the air and towards another goon that kicked her in another direction. If you come across this story on Amazon, be aware that it has been stolen from Royal Road. Please report it. When she stopped bouncing over the concrete floor and seeing stars, she shot a web line at one of the support columns holding the roof up and pulled herself towards it. Or maybe you're just lucky. One of the men called after her. I have yet to begin to fight random goon number three. Ghost Spider retorted, trying to ignore the aches in her jaw and ribs. The hits didn't seem to do much damage, but they really hurt. 
and unfortunately for the goon's ghost, Spider had mostly figured out how much the steroid had boosted them and how hard she could hit them. Right, sorry boys, this is going to hurt. Two Weblins shot out and attached themselves to the chests of two separate goons, both of whom looked at the lines of silk and laughed. What's the matter, Spider Girl, running out of webs? You didn't even get our arms this time, they jeered. Ghost Spider's eyes narrowed and curved in malicious glee. Nope, just going to do this instead. The heroine jumped straight out over the group of men she had been fighting with and pulled her webs upward. The two men she webbed screamed as they were suddenly yanked into the air and Ghost Spider used her newfound momentum to dropkick a third. She flipped Madair to land on her feet and pulled on the webs again, this time yanking them so the airborne men slammed into the ground around where the one she kicked landed. This time the men didn't get up after getting hit. They were solidly unconscious. Ghost Spider turned back to the now significantly more wary thugs. So, who's next? Oh, the goons didn't last long after that. Punches were delivered. Kicks were had and all of them got a generous amount of webbing donated to their own personal silk cocoons. Well, that's that. Ghost Spider mused, dusting her hands off. Now all that's left is the, oh, goddammit. At some point during the time Ghost Spider had been making the thugs regret their life choices, their boss had decided running was the smart idea and booked it. She turned to the groaning mass of men. Looks like your boss ditched you, so I'm gonna go after him real quick. You boys just hang around. I'm sure the cops will be here to cut you out, at some point anyway. Another web line let her ascend to the skylights and out onto the roof, where she was immediately drenched again by the ongoing storm. Hey Nightwing, the factory is handled, but the boss pulled a runner. I'm chasing him down now, but you think you can have the GCPD send someone over. She sent through the communicator while she scanned the surroundings, on the lookout for where the boss had run off to. That took a while. Any problems? Nightwing sounded distracted. He was probably multitasking. They used that new Venom formula. It took some time to stop them from getting up. She replied, Just give them some time for it to wear off, and it should be an easy pickup. I'll let them know. Cool, I've got to see a man about a drug problem. The sound of squealing tires rose above the constant sounds of rainfall. Ghost Spider looked down into the parking lot where she saw a car fish tailing out onto the street. She ended the call and started swinging after it. Not the most enjoyable experience between the rain reducing her visibility and the drops themselves stinging like hornets. The car pulled a sharp right turn and started to head towards the city. If it got lost in traffic or the boss bailed out in a building somewhere Ghost Spider was likely to lose him so it was a merry chase through terrible conditions as Ghost Spider leapt, swung, and launched herself through the air to follow the car that must have caught sight of her in the rearview mirror or wasn't slowing down until he was sure he had lost her. It took a bit, but she was eventually able to get close enough that she could get a web line on the car and reel herself in. That's when the car's driver knew for certain she was on his tail and decided to go absolutely nuts. Ghost Spider clung to the frame of the car for dear life as the driver did his best to kill them both by trying to navigate through the streets with his foot trying to push through the floor and yanking the wheel all over the place trying to throw her off. Thankfully the rain had driven everyone else off the road already or they would have crashed into someone by now. Look pal, you're just going to crash going like this. Just pull over already. Ghost Spider yelled, smacking the car's roof only to nearly fling herself off the vehicle when the driver pulled a handgun and started firing blindly back at her. Suddenly, Ghost Spider felt the car start drifting to the side and looked up to see a wall coming straight for her. Her eyes widened as she realized what was about to happen. The crazy bastard was going to try bumping the side of the car into a building to either crush her or knock her off. Unfortunately, that was the moment the tires lost their grip on the wet road and started hydroplaning. The car was now going fast enough there was no chance they weren't going straight into, and maybe even through, that wall. She had just enough time to brace, and then the car hit. Oh! Gah, and that's the ribs again. Ghost Spider groaned as she picked herself up off the floor. It felt like Supergirl had used her ribcage as a punching bag. Ghost Spider. She looked up to see not only Batgirl standing nearby, 
but also a group of what looked like mercenaries, Robin, and a gray-skinned man easily over six and a half feet tall in a ratty suit all standing around the room like they had been in the middle of a fight. Oh, hey there. What are you guys up to? Ghost Spider looked back at the driver she had been pursuing. Sure enough, it was the boss that had run off. It also looked like the crash had knocked him out. A generous amount of webbing ensured he wouldn't be running anywhere else anytime soon. I was just catching up with some local businessmen, but it looks like you guys were having a party. Suddenly, a large scaly green figure exploded out from a ruined pile of furniture that had hidden it from view. Looks like Killer Croc was here in addition to Solomon Grundy. And you even have a petting zoo. Ghost Spider quipped. So what kind of party did I crash? Chapter 25 Batgirl was the first to snap out of the shock of a car barreling through a wall and into their fight. Dr. Merlin has three copies of the Markov prototype spread out across the city, all synced to trigger from a signal from that machine. She pointed at the device in question. I need time to send the shutdown code to all of them or Gotham is going to look a lot more like a parking lot. Oh, this was serious then. Why didn't Nightwing tell me about this? Ghost Spider wondered while moving to cut off Croc from going after Batgirl. He doesn't know. Merlin uploaded a virus into the city power grid as a distraction and jammed our comms. Robin helpfully informed her as he flipped around Solomon Grundy. Unfortunately for him, the zombie didn't seem all that phased by the teenager's attacks. He was too slow to actually catch the boy wonder, though, so Ghost Spider felt safe leaving them be for a while and focus on the other supervillain in the mix. Killer Croc was a weird mix of furry and familiar for Ghost Spider. Dodging a large bipedal creature covered in scales was nothing new. The lizard, both versions, had desensitized Ghost Spider to that, even though technically this was the first time she was dealing with it. Hey, question. Your name isn't Peter by any chance, is it? She asked, dodging a clawed hand at the same time. Croc snarled. It's not. Now get back here. He lunged, but Ghost Spider sidestepped enough to grab him by the ankle and throw him into Grundy a short distance away. And that's why it felt foreign. That move wouldn't have worked on the lizard without her getting a tail to the face unless she got very lucky. It was also good to confirm she was probably facing Waylon Jones and not an ironic multiversal copy of one of her friends. That was a sentence she never thought she would mean seriously. Croc crashed to the floor in a heap and Robin took advantage of that, drop-kicking Grundy in the face and causing the zombie to trip over the other villain. Nice kick. Ghost Spider complimented the younger hero and held a hand up for a high five. Robin smirked and returned the gesture before turning back to the two thrashing villains. Thanks, but that isn't going to keep them down long. You think your webs can hold them? If I wrap them with enough of it, probably. But unless we wear them down some more, they'll probably tear right out of it. Robin grimaced. Well, crap. Grundy doesn't get tired. How do you normally beat him? Get someone on the magical side of things to restrain him or break something important. Other than that, and if he's weak enough that time around, pin him with something heavy. Ghost spider side-eyed Robin, one eye going wide in an imitation of a raised eyebrow. That time around? Yeah, sometimes he comes back strong enough to give multiple leaguers trouble. Thankfully, it's usually out of major areas when that happens. Doesn't seem like he's that strong this time either. Ghost Spider looked back at the two villains just in time to see Croc manage to push Grundy off of him and clamber back to his feet. The Saurian-looking villain looked rapidly around the room before fixing her with a death glare. Grundy rose to his feet much more slowly and rather than looking at the two heroes, looked back to where Batgirl had dismantled six mercenaries and left them unconscious and tied up and was now frantically typing away at the console responsible for activating the Markov devices. Grundy told to keep people away from Box. Grundy smashed Batperson. The zombie moaned, heading her way. Looks like he came back short in the smarts department too. Ghost Spider commented. That happens. The range tends to be from stupid to slightly smarter than a rock, though, so this is pretty normal. So we have to stop a super-powered zombie too dumb to quit. Yay! Robin shrugged. Someone's gotta. The two heroes were interrupted by a snarling croc pouncing at them. Robin leapt away and headed towards Grundy while Ghost Spider tangled with Killer Croc. Stolen from its original source, this story is not meant to be on Amazon. Report any sightings. 
You know, she started, punching Croc in the jaw and dodging a claw swipe. I get the doctor and even Grundy. Guy with a grudge and zombie too stupid to do anything but follow orders. What's your deal, Schnappy? The sudden nickname froze Croc long enough for Ghost Spider to plant a foot in his ribs, launching him through the air and giving her enough time to try tangling Grundy's feet with her webs while Robin knocked him over with some exploding birderings. Unfortunately, that was little more than an annoyance for the zombie, who easily tore the webbing off his feet and rose back to his feet. He did stop heading towards Batgirl in favor of trying to attack Robin, though, so progress. What did you call me? A visibly angry croc growled. What's that supposed to mean? He didn't seem incredibly invested in the answer as he started hurling boxes and debris at the wall crawler since being up close wasn't working out for him. Not very cultured, are you? I just called you a cute little alligator. No need to blow a gasket. Ghost Spider snarked as she ducked under a box, webbed it as it went by, and returned to sender. Too bad for her the wooden crate was empty and easily smashed to sawdust by her opponent. Hard to get all cultured when everyone is gawking at you for looking like this. Croc said bitterly, making Ghost Spider feel a bit bad for the comment. So when I got the chance to put all those bastards on the streets like me and make some huge stacks doing it, you bet I signed up for that. And bad feelings gone just like that. So she webbed him in the face. While Croc was temporarily blind and cursing up a storm, Ghost Spider yanked herself back towards Grundy. Robin was doing a good job being annoying, but at the end of the day, he was still a teenager that weighed at most 115 pounds going up against a super zombie somewhere around five times his weight. Robin, go for his knee. The boy wonder had been enhancing his hits with a metal bow staff and wasted no time slamming the pole into Grundy's knee. Even his best hit barely staggered him, but it knocked Grundy off balance enough that when Ghost Spider slammed into his chest like a web-guided missile, she flattened the giant zombie. Nice hit, you okay though? Robin asked. It didn't look like Ghost Spider had gotten hit anywhere, but when she landed, she had clutched her side painfully. Yeah, just feeling a bit sore from the car crash. You're going to be feeling more than that in a second. Croc announced his return to the fight by backhanding Robin out of the way and shoulder-checking Ghost Spider. Clawed hands pinned her until Croc slammed both of them into one of the machines nearby. Ghost Spider felt something crack but didn't have time to give it attention. She was too busy focusing on stopping Croc from taking a bite out of her even as he tried crushing her between his arms and the machine. Gah. Personal space, Scaly. Croc's response was to squeeze harder and go for another bite. And between her battered ribs, the lack of air, and the pain in her torso ghost spider's arms were actually starting to give ground and Croc was ignoring her repeated knees to the chest pretty well. His teeth were only a few centimeters from her collarbone when a whistling object flew through the air, slammed into Croc's head, and exploded. Both of them flinched at the boom and turned to where the object had come from. Batgirl had either finished or stopped working at the terminal for a second to help Ghost Spider out and had already thrown another object. A small metal canister landed almost perfectly in Croc's open mouth and when he reflexively bit down, sprayed a green-colored gas directly into his face. Gua. Whatever was in that canister worked fast. Croc went from murderous to knocked out in a few seconds. The Saurian villain's eyes rolled back and he fell over, releasing Ghost Spider in the process. The heroine stumbled as her feet hit the ground and leaned back into the machine she had been getting crushed into for support before looking over to her friend. Nice throw. Thanks for the help. Thought I might gag from his breath. She joked, weakly giving Batgirl a thumbs up. I saw. Good thing I had a breath mint. You okay? Ribs are going to be feeling tonight for a couple days, but I'm good. I'm guessing you stopped the signal. Batgirl nodded stopped and put all the devices into lockdown. They aren't going to go off without a full system reset and recalibration. Should give us enough time to find and secure them without someone trying to set them off manually. That's good. Then the only thing left is, hey guys, a little help. Right, the only thing left was Grundy. Now that they had handled the city-destroying plot and knocked out the rest of the bad guys, they could afford to take their time a bit, but Grundy was still very dangerous and needed to be handled carefully. Any ideas on how to bring him down? I'm guessing that gas won't work and he looks fine even though I hit him pretty hard earlier. 
Ghost Spider could probably shatter his spine or tear off a limb if she needed to, but she didn't exactly want to start tearing sentient creatures limb from limb even if they would recover if she didn't have to. That went way past her comfort zone for acceptable violence. Batgirl looked around the warehouse, eyes flickering to the crashed car, the machines around them, and the spot where Robin was keeping Grundy occupied. I think I have an idea. Oh! I don't think I like this plan. Hey, Grundy. Look, I'm touching the console. Ghost Spider yelled, patting the top of the machine. What? Grundy stopped chasing Robin to look back towards her. Sure enough, the sight of someone touching the thing he was supposed to be protecting was enough to get the zombies full attention for the time being. Grr. Grundy smash bug person. I'm an arachnid. Grundy not care. It was really hard to just stand there as a 500-pound zombie came running at you. But that was the plan, and Ghost Spider had to deal with it. As she dodged the first overhand blow, she idly noticed Robin had made his way over to Batgirl to get caught up on the plan, but then she was too busy trying to guide Grundy into position to pay attention to them. Really, the hard part was making sure he stayed in one spot without going into a rage and charging off somewhere. That meant intentionally dodging narrowly and staying close even when moving away and just repeatedly blinding him with webs might have worked better. Ghost Spider didn't just dodge, though. She landed some heavy punches and kicks that had rattled the undead's bones. They just didn't slow him down any. After what felt like an eternity of intense focus and careful attacks, Ghost Spider heard an engine roar to life and tires squeal as they burned out. Batgirl had managed to hotwire the drug dealer's car back to life despite it going through a wall. It wasn't going to run much longer by the look of it, but it was fine for one more drive. A drive straight for Grundy for a matter of fact. Ghost Spider stopped pretending to have issues getting away from the zombie and did her best to glue him to the floor with as many webs as possible. That distracted Grundy long enough to let her web away up to the ceiling and get in position for the next step. Bracing herself on the thick steel beam supporting the roof, she watched as Batgirl jumped out of the car a few feet from Solomon Grundy, attached a web line to the grill, and pulled up. The beaten-up car lifted off its front tires and hit Grundy in the chest at somewhere around 45 miles an hour. Spread out over a much larger area and with more weight than one super-powered spider person the car did, significant damage to the zombie, but even that wasn't enough to knock the fight out of him. That was fine. The car had only been the first step in Batgirl's plan. With Grundy wounded and knocked even closer to the large racks of machines near the console, he didn't even notice Robin straining to tip one of them over until it was falling on him. Batgirl, Robin, and Ghost Spider watched carefully as the dust settled. Grundy had been pinned by the machine, but he was still technically in the fight. Once their view cleared, they saw the gray-skinned zombie half-buried in metal and circuits, but beyond some groaning, he made no effort to escape. Woo! City saved and bad guys caught, who's up for pizza? Robin cheered. As long as you're buying. Ghost Spider chuckled. Now that the fight was over her ribs were making their displeasure known. We still need to secure the Markov prototypes, that girl said. But yeah, pizza sounds good. Despite the joking comments, all the heroes went about securing their defeated foes first. No need to ruin pizza time by having one of them escape, right? Chapter 26 the unfortunate truth of business is that people expected you to dress a certain way when going to meetings. If you were just meeting middle management or something business casual was fine, but when you meet the people at the top. Suits. It needed to be suits or you were on the back foot already. And even though Gwen didn't particularly care about that, she still had her father's lessons echoing in her ear about dressing for the position. And since she was scheduled to meet with one of the Wayne Entertainment bigwigs about another potential game, she needed to replace the outfit destroyed the last time her apartment was broken into. Too bad she couldn't just look up a design on the internet and shapeshift her symbiote into it. If anyone asked her for her jacket or anything like that, and she was unable to get it back in time, it would likely die and wind up a puddle of black goo. And that would be really awkward to explain. So that meant shopping. And not just walking in the store, finding the first thing that kind of fits shopping either. She was going to need to get something fitted. Gwen hadn't even started, and she wanted this to be over. Oh, why is it so hard to find a women's suit in the mall? Gwen raged three stores and no results later. 
For some reason, every department store either sold a random assortment of things that even someone as fashion oblivious as Gwen wouldn't consider business attire, or they simply sold one or two jackets with a skirt option. The men's clothing section had five different brands and four different styles of cuts. Where were the women's options? She would buy pants from the men's section if she had to, but boobs didn't exactly work with the jackets. All I want is something that fits and has pockets. Is that too much to ask? You won't find those in a department store. Not anything that's worth the price anyway. Gwen looked up at the comment and was surprised to see Barbara walking towards her with her own small shopping bag. Barbara, what are you doing here? There's a charity ball my dad was invited to for the resolution of the Falcone fiasco. He wanted to bring me along and I needed to restock on some makeup. She said, lifting her bag. Shouldn't you be getting that somewhere nicer than the mall if it's going to be that fancy? Barbara shrugged. Not really. Past a certain point, you're paying for the name rather than the product. Besides, I know how to work with these. If I need to spend a night being judged by some trophy wife, I want it to be because I look great with stuff that costs a third of what she is wearing, not because something is running. Gwen shrugged. Makeup had never been a big thing with her. She would just take Barbara's word for it. So why do you need a suit? I didn't think that was your style. Gwen told her about the upcoming meeting and the need for new clothes, which turned out to be a minor mistake as the redhead had finished her own shopping and was more than willing to drag her friend around looking for a new outfit. And then to her horror, Barbara dragged Gwen out of the mall without having purchased anything. Oh, so what are we here for again? Gwen asked with growing dread as they got closer to the building. Well, you still need an outfit. Barbara pointed out. Then why didn't we stay at the mall? Some of those suits fit pretty well. Barbara laughed. Gwen, you don't go to a department store for a suit. You go there to check some styles at most. Then you go to a specialist. This is a jewelry store, Barbara. The blonde pointed out. Yeah, so. Gwen stopped walking and gave her friend a look promising pain. So, generally jewelry stores don't sell suits. Oh, we're not here for that. Stolen content alert. This content belongs on Royal Road. Report any occurrences. At this point, Gwen didn't want to deal with her friends teasing. So she stopped walking, crossed her arms, and started tapping a foot impatiently. Barbara kept walking until she realized Gwen wasn't going to give in and follow her. She sighed and turned back. You couldn't just let me have fun? She whined. Gwen raised an eyebrow. With your shopping habits? I'd be lucky to get around to buying something before dinner. Hey, it's true and you know it. So why are you dragging me to somewhere completely unrelated? Barbara pouted childishly for a bit, but Gwen proved immune to it. Fine, we're here to talk with the manager. Of a jewelry store? Is she a fashion designer on the side or something? Close, her daughter is. Barbara clarified. She's pretty good too. And last I talked to her, she was taking commissions. I figured I'd introduce the two of you, you get a custom-tailored suit without getting gouged for it, and I get to spend time looking for a new bracelet. Gwen thought it over. On the one hand, this was likely going to take longer than simply finding an outfit and maybe getting it adjusted later. On the other, a custom outfit would mean she could actually have pockets bigger than the exact dimensions of a credit card. All right, let's go. She made a point of ignoring the happy noise her friend made. Blue Springs Jewelers was the kind of store Gwen would have never set foot in before her dad was killed, and she cheated her way into a lucrative career as a game dev. She would have considered herself much too poor for that. It was the kind of store where each item on display was perched on its own pedestal, suit-wearing guards unobtrusively watched from the corners, and a salesperson actually escorted each potential customer around. It was far too much for some shiny metal and fancy rocks in her opinion. Miss Gordon, how lovely to see you again. Back for more window shopping? A small Indian woman greeted them on the way in, which her friend responded to. Apparently familiar to call out to her by name and even joke a bit since most salespeople would be annoyed by someone spending a lot of time in stores, yet not actually buying anything. Mrs. Ahmed, and no, I'm here for Sabah actually. Barbara returned, though I wouldn't say no to any suggestions. Maybe something to show off at the charity gala? Mrs. Ahmed hummed. For your friend, I suppose, since you just picked up a dress from her yesterday? Give me a moment and I'll fetch her. 
With that, she walked away, leaving the two girls to stand around looking at the display stands. Gwen actually thought they were pretty neat. Most of the jewelry she was familiar with was mass-produced. These all seemed to be handmade. Still far too expensive, though. The woman returned with another girl not much older than either Gwen or Barbara. So mom said you were looking for an outfit? Please, let's head into the back. I'd be happy to give you a consultation. Sabah said while wrapping an arm around Gwen and not so subtly pushing her towards a door. Uh, is this allowed? Gwen squeaked nervously. I mean, aren't you working for the store right now? Eh, mom owns the place. If she's okay with it, then there's no issue. Besides, it's a slow day anyways. But, but... Gwen's protests fell on deaf ears, and when she turned to look to Barbara for help, the trader just smiled and waved as she was let off. Don't just stand there, help her. Oh! Barbara couldn't help but laugh at the pleading look Gwen gave her as she was taken to the back with Sabah. Seriously, it wasn't like she was being led to her execution or anything. So what made you bring that girl here? Mrs. Ahmed asked. I know you like to support my daughter's career when you can, but normally you wait until she isn't working here. Spur of the moment, really. Barbara shrugged. I found Gwen shopping for a suit for an upcoming business meeting, and she needed someone to guide her away from the mass-manufactured stuff. Hmm. And I needed to make sure she didn't just grab the first thing that looked okay and fit. Another friend of mine that has a line to Wayne Entertainment told me one of the execs has it out for her. Gwen needs every advantage she can get right now. Rather, some of Bruce's automated systems flagged some emails from inside his company pushing for people to blacklist Gwen for some reason, and she had caught them while looking for signs of corruption now that the criminal underworld was reeling from recent events. And why not tell her that? Oh, I will, but only after her meeting. Barbara assured the other woman. Gwen gets really sarcastic when she's mad at someone. I'd rather she didn't burn bridges because of something I said. Plus, her games are really good despite being pretty simple. She'll be fine. Mrs. Ahmed just hummed again before shaking her head and changing the subject. Well, she's your friend. You would know her best. No. If you're looking for something yourself, we have a lovely new addition right over here. Oh. That wasn't so bad, was it? Sabah asked a short time later. If you say so, Gwen grumbled. Truthfully, it hadn't been that bad at all. Sabah had been pretty fast about getting the measurements she needed and had taken steps to make sure Gwen was comfortable throughout the process. At this point, she was mostly holding a grudge because if Barbara ever found out she didn't totally hate the experience, she would take it as an excuse to drag Gwen out on even more shopping trips. So I've been meaning to ask, Gwen said in an obvious topic change. What's the deal with the amulet? Some kind of specialty item you only show certain people. If so, Gwen could see why. The amulet was a massive emerald set with some intricate gold metalwork. Even locked behind the clear glass case, she could tell it was on another level compared to the rest of the pieces here, and she wasn't exactly a jewelry buff. Not really. That's actually from someone's private collection being donated to the gala to raise money for the charity. The fashion designer shrugged. There's going to be an auction with any money raised going to the fund. They're celebrating the takedown of a criminal group during an auction. With another auction? Sabah smiled. Hey, never let it be said the upper class isn't consistent. Besides this, at least, let some people see this beauty in person before it winds up forgotten in some rich person's closet for a few years. Something special about it? Yeah, it's called the Spring Isles Emerald. It's one of the biggest gems of its kind in the world. Collectors would give an arm and a leg to have it in their collection for just a little while. The bragging rights alone would be worth it. Really? Gun gave the amulet another look over. Nope, still just looked like a fancy rock to her. Ha ha ha, yeah that's why I'm going into fashion, even though mom runs the store. Seems more fun designing for the person than waving some unchanging item around, no matter how much it's worth. Sabah laughed when Gwen repeated her thoughts out loud. Whatever suits you, I guess. Gwen snarked, getting another laugh out of Sabah with the pun. So when do you? Gwen's spider sense went off. Trusting her instincts, she threw herself on top of Sabah and did her best to shield the other girl as the room suddenly exploded. She felt herself smash into a rack of metal shelves and looked up just in time to see parts of the ceiling falling on her. Oh! Boom! 
Barbara stopped mid-sentence as the building rocked from an explosion. And while her training was enough to stop her from falling over, she had to quickly reach out and steady Mrs. Ahmed, who had no such advantages. She barely had time to wonder what happened before she saw smoke pouring out of one of the back room doors. Gwen! Saba! All over the store, people burst into motion. Some of the security guards began escorting people out of the store. Others ran towards the room Gwen and Saba had gone into, but none of them were faster than Barbara. She burst through the door, shortly followed by Saba's mother, and looked around the room. Fittingly, it looked like a bomb had gone off. Practically everything was broken and scattered, but she did see her friends starting to move from under a pile of debris. Gwen, you okay? What about Saba? She cried, rushing to her friend's side and helping her both dig herself out of the rubble and looking her over for injuries. I think we're both fine. Gwen coughed. I managed to shield her from the worst of it before the drop ceiling fell on us. I think she's just unconscious. Oh, thank God. Mrs. Ahmed exclaimed, falling to her knees next to her daughter. Thank goodness you are both okay. We should still call an ambulance. Barbara suggested. Just to be sure. Yes, yes, that seems like a... Ma'am, bad news. One of the security guards interrupted. It looks like someone has stolen the amulet. Chapter 27 You find anything out? Gwen asked Barbara when they were finally able to meet up again on top of a random high-rise. Being caught in ground zero of an explosion meant that she had spent hours first getting checked over by first responders, then getting some scans done at a hospital to make sure there were no internal injuries, and then getting questioned by the police to see if she noticed anything strange beforehand. Sabah and her mother also wanted to thank her as well, which was nice, but a bit awkward since she hadn't actually done that much. And then she had to deal with the circling Renee Montoya because once again Gwen had been very dangerously involved with Gotham's criminal element in under a month. It was possible Gwen could have sent the older woman away earlier, especially because Montoya probably had plenty of work investigating she needed to do herself. But as one of the very few adult influences still in her life, she was just happy the detective cared. So it was only much later that Gwen was able to dig out the communicator and set up a place to meet her friend. A few things. Barbara replied, For one, Blue Springs Jewelers wasn't the only place hit. For other places were robbed the same way within an hour of each other. Each one had one item stolen, even though there were plenty of other things at each site worth a lot of money to the right people. The only clues the police were able to find immediately were some cards left at the scene. She pulled out her phone and swiped through a few pictures. Each one was of a simple piece of cardstock with one word on it except for the last one. Who could it be? Gwen raised an eyebrow and handed the phone back. Isn't that a little obvious? The question mark is his symbol. Barbara nodded. It is, but the Riddler has never been known for being humble. He wants everyone to know he was the one to pull the robberies. So what's the riddle then? She shrugged. I think we need to figure that out ourselves. So far, all I've got is each card corresponds to the place that was stolen from. In order, World of Antiques, Carol's Diamonds, Indigo Trading, and Blue Springs Jewelers all had a card left behind. And the question mark? An armored truck that was hit seconds after it received the item, but hadn't made it off the property. So it blurs the line of who exactly was robbed. Cute, I guess. Gwen scowled. Legally, not really, but close enough. Barbara agreed. So who's doing what? Nightwing is keeping an eye on things in case this is a distraction, Robin is helping the police look for more clues, and I've got a few trawlers going through the dark web looking for any signs of the items being sold. Gwen was a little jealous the other girl had the space and the setup to do such a thing. Sure, she technically had the funds to rent her own space and set up a connection. But people did monitor the web for those types of programs and attempted to backtrack them, on both sides of the law, because they wanted to know who was collecting that data and for what. And Gwen didn't exactly have the connections Batman did to hide that from everyone. Such was life, though. She would just have to settle for superpowers and leave the techno-wizardry to the Bat family for now. And putting it that way made her feel much better about herself and a touch less jealous. So just wait and see? For now. Barbara sighed and pulled her cowl back on. 
Maybe we'll find another clue soon, but this isn't the only thing going on. As if summoned by that comment, the police scanner suddenly crackled to life. Attention all units, attention all units. Robbery in progress at Gotham National Bank. Gwen perked up, pulling on her own mask. That isn't far from here. Nope. Bar Batgirl was already moving towards the edge of the building. Race you there? The race wasn't even close. Oh, damn it, where are Eric and JP? Sean cursed as he and Vinny ran down some back alleys. The robbery had been a snap, but the cops managed to block off their getaway car, so the four of them made a break for it on foot. Unauthorized reproduction. This story has been taken without approval. Report sightings. They split off. Said they'd meet us at the safe house. Vinny panted. Sean didn't blame him. Carrying all their gear along with the cash was heavier than he thought it would be. Fuck, fine. Assholes better not be late. The two of them ran nonstop for nearly ten minutes before they felt safe enough to slow down. No way was any cop going to be able to follow them through the maze of Gotham streets on foot, and they didn't see any patrol cars on the roads. They still kept their guard up, though. Horror stories of the Bat Brigade appearing out of the shadows made sure no one relaxed until the money was split and hidden away. Speaking of, so how much do you think we snagged? Vinny thought it over. We got slowed down checking for dye packs, so, I dunno, maybe around 30k each? That was it? Fuck. That would barely cover his debts, but maybe he could double up by checking out a casino or two. He'd made some decent money at them before, and that one dealer said he could come back anytime. The two bank robbers quickly made their way to an abandoned apartment building and pushed through a door, ignoring the condemned notice pasted on the front. They were just here to meet up, split the cash, and slip out into the city once they changed clothes. Anything left behind would either be scavenged by some homeless bum or buried when the building got demolished, if that ever happened. Fifteen minutes later, though, the two of them were starting to get nervous. Where the fuck are they? Sean raged as he paced back and forth. Vinny was nervously looking out the window every few seconds, but tried sounding calm. They probably took a longer route back. They should be here any. There was a slight sound of creaking wood down the hall that instantly shut Vinny up. The two listened in and could have sworn they heard footsteps. After a quick look and a nod from both of them, they slid into hiding spots and pulled their handguns out of their jackets. Both of them held their breath as the door was silently pushed open and two dark figures stepped inside. Sean's heart almost leapt out of his throat when he recognized the two. He nearly exploded out of his hiding spot shouting, fucking finally. What took you so long? Eric jumped like someone had punched him and whirled to face Sean. Goddamned asshole. What are you doing hiding like the fucking Batman? Shite. You two nearly gave me a heart attack. JP added. And it's not like we hit up a club on the way back. We needed to make sure nobody was following us. Sean shoved his gun back into its holster. Whatever, let's hurry the fuck up and split the cash and get out of here. Place gives me the creeps. JP scoffed. What worried Batman is going to come for your ass? Dude, don't jinx us. Vinny whined. Yeah, yeah, let's get this over with. It turned out Vinny was wrong about his guess, much to Sean's pleasure. Each one of them would be walking out of here with 40,000 each. Not too much more, but enough that he wouldn't be worried about loan sharks poking around him for not making payments. He could even hit up a casino without needing to make a score for a bit before lining up another job. Just for fun. They were all just cleaning up the stacks and making sure nothing that could be tied to them was left behind when there was a loud thump out in the hallway. All four of the robbers froze. The building was condemned, sure, but that didn't mean people didn't still come through. Homeless addicts, teens trying to prove themselves they could handle. Cops or even worse, Batman. They didn't want to think about it. You guys hear that? Eric whispered. Yeah, think we all did. JP said back. Someone check the street. Make sure no cops are camped outside. Vinny edged towards the window and leaned outside a bit. I don't see Noth. What the fuck? MP Fache. The other three could only watch as something grabbed Vinny and pulled him out the window. Guns were pulled and they all sprinted to see what got their friend, only to see nothing outside. No cops, no capes, no Vinny. Not even on the ground below. It was like he was just swallowed into the shadows. Dude, Eric started. Sean wasn't having it. 
No. Dude. No. Fuckers. Vinny just got banished. I am not staying here. JP bolted to their stuff. Sean grabbed him before he could run out the door. Calm down, dumbass. Vinny just got ganked like some B-movie horror victim. We are not going to run out like idiots and get picked off one by one. Grab the rest of the shit. We're getting out of here. What about Vinny? Eric asked. If we find him? Great. If not, well, I think the Batman got him. Fuck. Yeah, fuck was about right. Still, Sean wasn't going to let two potential me shields run off and leave him to face whatever the fuck that was by himself. So he grabbed the cash and his gun and motioned for the others to hurry the fuck up. The three stepped out into the hall and made a point of checking each room they passed, especially the ceilings, but they saw nothing. Nothing until JP looked behind them and saw a flash of white dip into one of the rooms. What the fuck was that? He shouted, getting the other two's attention. What was what? Sean snapped. Some white thing. In the shadows. White was not Batman's colors. It wasn't any of the other Bat families either. Something else was in here with them. Right? We're going right for the exit. No stops, no distraction. Where the fuck is Eric? The other man had just vanished. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, and JP was freaking out. Sean was just about to ditch him and make a break for it when a soft thwip rang out and something white and stringy swallowed JP's head and started dragging him off. Sean nearly fumbled his gun trying to bring it up to snap off a few shots, but it didn't stop whatever was dragging JP off from pulling him around a corner. Figuring he was either fucked by whatever was in here anyway, Sean ran after JP hoping to get a better shot at whatever was hunting them or at least get JP back. But when he turned the corner, there was nothing there. Who? Who's there? He screamed, more out of hysterical frustration than anything. I am vengeance. A growling female voice rang out from seemingly all around him. Sean snapped off a few random shots hoping to hit the thing in here with him. I am the knight, a different voice said from the shadows. Sean whirled and squeezed the trigger, but the gun clicked empty. He pulled the empty clip and practically threw it away in his haste to swap to a spare. Before he could ram it home, there was a soft thump behind him. I am. Sean managed to twist around just in time to see the face of the thing that was going to end him. The blank white face except for two large blood-rimmed eyes. No mouth or nose. At least no mouth until a huge fang maw split its face from ear to ear. Ghost spider. Sean's legs gave out, and his eyes rolled into the back of his head as he passed out. Oh! Okay, I need to ask. Gwen, what the fuck? Barbara finally demanded once they handed the robbers off to the police. She had agreed to the stealth takedown because it seemed like the best way to make sure no one got hurt, but she had not been expecting to see Gwen sprout a smile that looked like it would be right at home on Killer Croc's face. Yeah, sorry. My suit's probably getting hangry. I'm normally better about keeping it from going all toothy. Gwen, ghost spider, said sheepishly, rubbing the back of her head. I'm sorry, your suit is getting hangry? Yep, didn't I explain this? I felt like I explained this. Barbara took a deep breath. When would you have explained this? She was barely holding back her shock. It wasn't helping Gwen was looking at her like Essie was the crazy one here. You know, in the cave where you took me after I almost died? The one where you drugged me into unmasking to you all? Barbara sighed. We drugged you so you weren't feeling the ten holes in your chest not to unmask you. And you were high most of that time. Then you kinda stormed out because you were pissed at us. With reason, she added when Gwen glared at her. But we never got back to talking about what the suit is. Ghost Spider took a deep breath of her own and started explaining. Okay, so Clintar 101. They're a symbiotic alien race that bond with a host and empower them. I'm 99% sure mine is a lesser lab-grown version because they are supposed to have their own personality alongside the hosts, but mine doesn't. But one thing all Clintars need is a steady diet of phenethylamine. If I don't get enough, it makes the suit and me, I guess, a bit more aggressive and moody. So hangry. Phenethylamine. Why does that sound familiar? It's the happy feel-good chemical found in chocolate. Wait, are you saying your powers force you to eat chocolate? Barbara blinked. Gwen seemed smug. Yes, and they even make sure the calories don't affect my figure unless I want it to. I think I hate you a little. 
Ah, uh, yes. The other thing my powers rely on. The envious tears of my haters. Chapter 28 As much as Ghost Spider didn't want to admit it, she wasn't going to be the one to track down the Riddler through some computer wizardry. She had already admitted to herself that the Bat Brigade had the better setup and resources for that. Even if they had the same equipment, Barbara was simply better than her. Gwen could follow a tune when it came to hacking and information gathering. Barbara was the one who made the music. Of course, Gwen would be the one orchestrating a symphony when it came to mechanical engineering with the redhead playing second seat. Increasingly tortured metaphors aside, if Ghost Spider was going to add anything new to the investigation, it was going to be going to be by searching Gotham street by street. Not that she was running totally blind. Batgirl had given her a few shaky leads that they normally would have ignored until they had gotten more solid information. Ghost Spider didn't find anything that would point them towards the Riddler, but at least she was ruining the night of quite a few small-time crooks as a bonus. Did we miss something at the scenes themselves? The wall crawler asked over the comms as she swung through the city to the next spot Batgirl had marked as an area of interest. If we did, so did the police, and it probably would have been cleaned up by now. Cleanup crews started moving the debris this morning. Batgirl informed her. But that doesn't fit the Riddler's M.O. He's the type to hand us every clue we need and gloat we couldn't put them together. No, we're just missing something. Don't suppose there is a convenient map written in invisible ink on those cards, huh? Ghost Spider snarked. Huh, I wish. Closest thing I got to a map was comparing the timing and locations for each robbery and superimposing them over a city map. I got what was starting to look like a vector diagram, but it wasn't a perfect fit. One of the points was too far east to match. Could you just leave that point out? If I had more data, maybe, but we only have five points to look at. Besides throwing away 20% of my data because it doesn't fit right isn't something a perfectionist like Nigma would do. Ghost Spider landed in a crouch on one of Gotham's many skyscrapers and spotted another mugging in progress. Crap, got another one. I'll call you back. Sure, just remember you have that meeting with Wayne Entertainment tomorrow. She had actually forgotten about that. Barbara was a really good friend. Gwen decided she would have to forgive the redhead for dragging her through the mall for hours. She might even need to do something nice for the other girl later. That would have to wait, though. Right now she had a criminal to terrify apprehend. Ghost Spider dropped off the wall. Stop right there, buddy. That doesn't belong to you. Oh! Barbara sighed and pushed her chair back as dozens of analysis programs chugged along on the many screens of the back computer. Despite having bleeding-edge tech that put most governments to shame, she wasn't really expecting the results to give her anything solid to follow up on. There simply wasn't enough for anything to really give them a solid clue. If Bruce was here, he probably would have already narrowed down the search area based on some gut feeling that led to an ironclad string of evidence, but Barbara wasn't him. She needed a firm starting point before she could find the obscure details no criminal wanted people to know. That was why she liked working with computers. It didn't matter what the topic was. Once someone had it entered into a digital space, it played by certain rules. Rules Barbara knew inside and out to the point that even not air-gapping was a guarantee she couldn't find a way in. And for those, all she needed to do was find the physical location and use a more personal touch. Still nothing on the Riddler case? Dick asked on his way past her workstation. Between him keeping an eye on Gotham with Bruce gone and her looking for any sign of the Riddler, the two of them had been spending so much time together that they could decipher the other's mood by their breathing. Nothing, and we're running out of time too. She agreed in a huff. Dick shrugged. I'm sure the charity will run just fine, even without the stolen exhibits. Not just that. The Riddler won't just wait around forever. Allowing the Spring Isle's emerald amulet to be stolen is going to really affect Mrs. Ahmed's store's reputation. She doesn't deserve it, and I don't want to be the one to let him get away. Stolen novel. Please report. Gwen doesn't have any convenient leads. Barbara sat up and glared at him. Don't start. And I thought you were going to tone down the rampant paranoia. Dick sighed. Not what I meant. She did some really good groundwork before the fiasco. I was wondering if she picked up anything off the street. Hmm. Barbara wasn't sure she believed him, but let it go. He was trying to be reasonable after all. 
She didn't have anything the last time we talked and she's busy with a business meeting today, so it's not likely she'll have anything new until tonight at least. And she's been mostly checking out areas I've picked out, so unless I guessed right or she gets lucky, she shouldn't have anything new. Barbara was briefly distracted as she spotted Tim enter the cave followed by Alfred. A quick glance at the clock reassured her she hadn't skipped a meal, so they were probably just checking in. Relieved she wasn't about to be on the receiving end of one of Alfred's speeches about self-care, she blurred the monitors and decided a short break was in order. Hey, Dick, Babs. How's things going? Tim greeted while Alfred offered a cup of coffee to them both, one Barbara gratefully accepted. Hey, yourself, short stuff. Dick replied, grinding a fist into the top of Tim's head, despite the younger boy's protests, before accepting his own cup from the dutiful butler. And all quiet for now, though we might have some triad gangs looking to muscle in on some of the Falcone's old turf. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Is that why you're looking at a five elements diagram? Tim asked, annoyedly fixing his hair once he escaped from Dick's grasp. A what? Five elements, you know the Chinese thing? Earth, water, fire, wood, metal, and all that. Tim pointed at the blurred screen Barbara had been working on. With the screen inactive, it did look a bit like a circle made of five colored blobs. Is that not what that is? No, it was just the images of what the Riddler stole, but now that it was pointed out, Barbara was going to look into the possibility. It was a new perspective at the very least. Oh! Gwen scowled all the way home from her meeting with Wayne Entertainment. The whole thing had nearly gone wrong from the start when Gwen called in to confirm the appointment with a secretary only to find out the meeting had been moved last minute to an entirely separate building. Apparently, they had sent her an email to inform her of the change, but nothing appeared in her inbox until five minutes before the meeting time. The tight expression on the XX face when Gwen not only showed up on time, but at the correct location all but confirmed the timing was intentional. She had no idea why the person she was meeting with seemed determined to dismiss her pitch every chance she could despite the marketing people in the meeting seeming pretty excited about her new idea. Only half-remembered lessons from her dad about keeping cool under pressure and some additional memories from the event that gave her the symbiote let her get through that entire mess without losing her temper. She still needed to go over the contract before signing, but unless there was something non-negotiable, she was pretty sure she could sign within the month. And while the promise of more future money she could safely spend as a civilian was encouraging, it did nothing to calm the frustration of having to sit through some moron in a pantsuit complain that her ideas wouldn't work in the large-scale Wayne Enterprises worked at and was derivative of things already out on the market. As long as you ignored the fact that all the games she brought up were released after her first game and that the second shared some minor art assets at best. It was almost a relief when the blonde cell phone went off, distracting her from her building emotional outburst. Gwen quickly answered it after a quick glance at the caller ID. Hey Barbara, I'm guessing you found something if you're calling me? Hi Gwen, and yeah, maybe. You think you can meet me by the docks tonight? Wear something formal, this could be important. In other words, show up in costume because she would be showing up as Batgirl. I can do that. We in a rush or anything? No, it can wait till later. Just wanted to catch you before you made any other plans. I'll message you with the details in a bit. Meaning she would send it to the secure communicator. Cool, I'll see you later then. Gwen hung up, feeling slightly better. Maybe she would be able to take out these feelings on something deserving. Oh! Later that night, Ghost Spider found out she was the last one to the meeting spot. Not only that, but it wasn't just Batgirl. Nightwing and Robin had shown up as well. The spider-themed heroine made sure to land somewhat far away, no need to make anyone jumpy, but quickly approached the group with a wave. Hey guys, everyone here for this one lead? Nightwing not so subtly looked her over before shaking his head. No. We got word of a triad drug operation setting up nearby. Robin and I are going to check that out while you two follow up on the Riddler lead. Ghost Spider wasn't super thrilled her friend was still holding her at arm's length, but at least he was talking to her. So progress? What? Scared we'll give you cooties or something? Robin laughed. He just doesn't want to admit we'll be hanging around in case Riddler tries to run off and taking down some drug smugglers as a bonus. 
Nightwing gave the younger boy a light smack to the back of his head, much to his expressed displeasure, and started walking off. At least he was nice enough to remind them both to be careful as he left. Still not talking to me, I see? Ghost Spider asked rhetorically. He's getting better. Batgirl offered. Both of them looked at each other and shrugged. Now wasn't the time to get into personal drama. Okay, what do we got? Ghost Spider asked. A couple warehouses I managed to track down all owned by Enigmatic Industries. If that isn't where the Riddler is holed up, I'll eat my cowl. No need to go that far, but how'd you figure it out? Last we talked, you were convinced it had to be somewhere in the west side of the city. Batgirl grimaced. A bit of luck, timing, and Chinese element diagrams. Huh. I'll tell you later. Right now we've got a thief to catch. One of Ghost Spider's eyes widened in a parody of a raised eyebrow. If you say so. The two heroines stealthily made their way towards the buildings Batgirl had pointed out. Unlike most of the ones surrounding them, these buildings had been obviously modified so that there were no windows or skylights to infiltrate from unexpected angles. Recently, too, based on some of the weld marks on the walls. Batgirl was obviously right that someone didn't want people poking around here. That did leave them both in a quandary of how to actually investigate. Unfortunately, the only thing they could reasonably do was pick the lock and go through the front door. They barely had gotten started and already the Riddler was leading them into his game. Careful. Ghost Spider whispered as Batgirl cracked the lock in under 15 seconds. Despite the ease of getting through the door, there was always the possibility of a booby trap just behind it. I know, Batgirl whispered back and snaked a camera into the small gap in the door. I don't see anything connected, but the rest is pitch black. We'll have to be careful. With that warning, the two carefully moved into the warehouse. They barely made it two feet inside before Ghost Spider's spider sense blared a warning. Acting on instinct, the black and white clad heroine threw herself onto her friend and pushed them further into the warehouse as something big and heavy crashed into the ground right behind them. In addition to the loud sound, several lights snapped on at the same time, revealing the two had been forced into a large pyramidal structure made of some clear material and that the crashing sound had been the back, wall sliding into place. Moments later, a TV outside the structure turned on. Well, well, well. I was wondering what was taking Batman so long, but it seems he's been delegating to the Junior Leagues. The Riddler in his iconic green question mark covered suit smirked from the display. But don't worry, while the Bat will have plenty of time to regret his unwise decision, you two will only be bothered for a few minutes. A timer appeared in the bottom corner of the display, and at the same time a metal plate at the top of the structure pulled back. Ghost Spider and Batgirl weren't stuck in a pyramid. They were stuck in a giant hourglass. And the sand pouring in from above wasn't trickling in slowly. Chapter 29 Getting buried alive wasn't really on the list of things Ghost Spider had been expecting when she and Batgirl went after the Riddler. But as far as death traps went, this one seemed lackluster. It was, after all, just a big glass box filling with sand. And she had super strength. Cover your head. I'm not sure how this is going to break. She told Batgirl, walking up to the wall and cracking her knuckles. Her friend crouched down and pulled her cape up to cover the rest of her. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Riddler's mocking voice came from the TV. Ghost Spider ignored him, pulling her fist back, and then with a shout slammed it into the clear material. Ah, only to collapse on the slowly rising layer of sand clutching her hand in pain when the wall refused to break. Ghost Spider Reinforced polycarbonate acrylic backed by a transparent aluminum mesh. Riddler said smugly, guaranteed to stand up to anything a certain flying rodent might be carrying with him. But don't worry, there's still a way out if you're fast and clever enough. If not... He waved at the sand still pouring in and the implied demise it represented. While Ghost Spider flexed her hand a couple times and growled at the supervillain, Batgirl was studying the room they were trapped in. The Riddler had a psychological need to prove himself more clever than everyone around him, even to the detriment of himself in several situations such as giving away his current location when he could have simply vanished after his string of robberies. There was some way out of this that they just needed to put the clues together for. The wall they had come in from had been secured to the rest of the hourglass with thick metal clamps on the outside. 
The walls themselves had no distinguishing marks, and there wasn't anything obviously visible in the warehouse either. That meant their way out could only be in two places. The funnel where the sand was coming from, or the floor below them. G.S., try doing something about the sand. I think the exit is on the floor, Batgirl shouted and began doing her best to shift the sand out of the way so she could reach the bottom. The sand, huh? Ghost Spider muttered, looking at the falling stream of the stuff. She experimentally shot a line of webbing through it to try gumming up the hole, but the falling sand easily swallowed it. And what am I supposed to do about it? She complained, but started shooting webs around the top of their section of the hourglass. Eventually, the wall crawler was able to build up a pretty thick sheet of webbing to slow down the stream, but the sand was too heavy and fine to stop completely. Bits were still falling through the gaps, but Ghost Spider was too busy making sure the entire thing didn't collapse under the weight to plug them. You better hurry, I don't think this is going to last long. Batgirl didn't reply, too busy shoveling sand out of the way. Her heart fell for a moment when her fingers brushed over a metal floor with no sign of a way out, but it picked back up when they caught on a hidden latch. Giving it a solid tug revealed a tablet with the message, what flattens all mountains, wipes out all species, destroys every building, and turns everything into pieces, displayed on the screen. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. What now? He's got the thing hooked up to an actual riddle. Batgirl exclaimed. And it's one about time when he stuck us in a giant hourglass. Yes, a bit on the nose, I'll admit. Riddler chuckled from his screen. But I figured I'd start off easy. A little something to get the thinking juices flowing. Then he scowled. Although having a partner to give you a leg up probably made it a bit too easy. Nevertheless, you got the correct answer. On to the next riddle. The narrative has been stolen. If detected on Amazon, report the infringement. He pushed a button on the top of his cane. Suddenly, the floor of the hourglass dropped away, allowing the two heroines to fall into the darkness below. Oh! Having the floor drop out from under her wasn't something Ghost Spider had been expecting, but that wasn't to say she didn't react to it. Her first reaction was to try shooting a web line back into the hourglass to stop her fall, but a sharp panel closed over the hole and cut it. Her next thought, though it was more instinctual reaction, was to grab Batgirl and keep her close so they wouldn't end up separated and blindly shoot a web into the dark in hope that it would break their fall before they hit the ground. She was half successful in that as she managed to stop them from falling into what was probably the next trap, but was completely unprepared when a second later a sheet of metal swatted them out of the air until they crashed into a room filled with water and had to quickly swim to the surface. Pa, you all right? Batgirl sputtered as she spat water out of her mouth. She was a little worried because her friend was the one to take most of the impact from the thing that launched them here. Why, yeah, nothing broken at least. Ghost Spider hissed even as her side and shoulder throbbed with each movement as she tried treading water. You have to stop taking hits like those. Trust me, I'm not doing it on purpose. The two stopped talking as they inspected the new room they found themselves in since they were pretty sure this was another trap. Not many places had giant underground water tanks lying around after all. Unfortunately for them, their surroundings were too dark to make much out. Beyond some shadowy impressions of the edges of the tank, everything was pretty much black. Think you can pull us up to the ceiling? Batgirl asked after a bit. I'm pretty sure we skipped over one trap already. I'd love to do it again if we could. I'll give it a shot. Ghost Spider once again shot a web line straight up, but before it got too high there was a flash of something metallic that flew through the air and severed it. Uh, uh, uh. No more of that now. Another TV screen snapped to life showing a visibly annoyed Riddler. Did you think I wouldn't take countermeasures against cheaters? Well, sorry for not obediently going along with the plans of the guy trying to kill us. Ghost Spider deadpanned, only to freeze up when something brushed her leg. Wait, Batgirl, that wasn't you, was it? What wasn't me? Something brushed up against Ghost Spider's leg again, and this time she could tell Batgirl felt it too. That. Both girls tried scanning the dark waters for any sign of what touched them, but it was no use. There was no sign of what was in there with them. Oh, did I forget to mention that Tank is home to a particularly nasty kind of crocodile? Riddler drawled. I'd turn the lights on so you could see, 
but the switch is located at the end of the previous room. You know, the one you skipped. Ah, uh, well, do your best to figure out the answer before your new friend decides he's hungry if you can. He waved and the TV shut off, cutting off the small amount of light it offered. Ghost Spider twitched as she felt that thing move in the water again. It was getting more curious. It wouldn't be long until something happened. You have any ideas? She asked Batgirl. If this is anything like the first trap, we need to answer a riddle to escape. And the question itself is probably hidden in here somewhere. And since we already figured out we can't go up, that means. She looked at the water. The clues are hidden below us with the hungry crocodile. Ghost Spider groaned. In the dark where we can't see two feet in front of us. Great. That girl swallowed heavily. I have a rebreather and a flashlight on my belt. You happen to have a spare? No. Ghost Spider sighed. Yeah, thought so. All right, you search for the riddle. I'll put on my best Steve Irwin impression and buy you some time. yippee ki cowgirl. Red-rimmed eyes narrowed at her friend. I'm going to ignore that for now. But after this? We're doing a TV marathon to fix your butchering of beloved TV animal icons and 80s action heroes. TV rots your brain. That girl huffed defensively. Possibly. Probably why I think this is a good idea. Ghost Spider responded just as the crocodile passed by again. This time, the spider-themed hero reached out and latched on using her powers, praying the croc wasn't in a position to clamp down on her arm the whole time. The reaction was immediate. While the animal had been content to poke at the two intruders in its territory while making up its mind on which one to take a bite out of first when they were just floating there, being attacked by one of its meals set it off. The large aquatic reptile instantly began thrashing around trying to either dislodge its newly acquired passenger or get its mouth on it instead. Ghost Spider could only hold on for the ride and try to keep her limbs away from the croc's mouth. She might have superpowers, but super strength didn't do much when she had no leverage and her opponent was built for the water. Once she saw Ghost Spider begin to distract the hungry predator, Batgirl immediately crammed the rebreather into her mouth and began diving towards the bottom of the tank. Her belt flashlight was easily able to shine through the slightly murky water, but it still took a bit of time to find anything with the small amount of light available to her. Even when she did, it wasn't particularly helpful either. Just a rock with the message 7, 3, 8. Nothing is correct carved into it. Clearly only a part of the riddle. And not a very helpful one either. She moved on. Several messages later, Batgirl headed back to the surface. She thought she had found all the messages in the tank, but there was no clear direction she could find. 6, 8, 2. One number is correct and well placed. 6, 4, 5. One number is correct but wrong place. 2, 0, 6. Two numbers are correct but wrong places. 7, 8, 0. One number is correct but wrong place. Obviously, it was some kind of three-number combination, but what were they supposed to do with it? It didn't help that she had seen Ghost Spider still struggling with the crocodile at several points. The other girl doing her best in a contest of stamina with the animal that at any point was capable of causing severe injury with a single bite. Once Batgirl breached the surface of the water, she looked around for any sign of where the combination was supposed to go, but all she saw was a heavily panting ghost spider treading water. You okay? The redhead asked as she swam over, doing her best to keep an eye out for the crocodile. Any problems on your end? So good so far. Ghost spider breathed. But it hasn't been easy. That croc definitely isn't a normal animal. Way too strong. And it's not acting like an ambush predator at all. Or it wasn't until a second ago. It threw me off and then just vanished. Fantastic news. That girl griped. I've got better ones, though. She gave Ghost Spider a quick rundown on the parts of the riddle she found and the lack of any further directions. Given that the spider heroine had been crocodile wrestling the entire time, she wasn't expecting Ghost Spider to have much to say immediately, but to her surprise, she was wrong. I think I know where to look. There's a grate at the bottom of the tank over that way behind some rocks. Ghost Spider pointed in the general direction. How do you know that? Batgirl asked curiously. Was it another power Ghost Spider hadn't told her about yet? I got scraped all across it when new boots tried to drown me. 
Ghost Spider Deadpanned. Oh, sounds fun. Chapter 30. The two heroines carefully made their way over to the direction Ghost Spider indicated, constantly on guard for any indication that the giant saurian in the tank was about to appear. But despite both of them straining every sense they had, they were unable to pick up even a trace of the crocodile's trail. Even when they both made it to the great the spider-themed heroine described neither one of them could catch a glimpse of it. Not that that was very comforting. Between the murky water reducing visibility to under 10 feet and the rocks containing multiple places for the hungry reptile to hide, neither one of them relaxed their guard even as Batgirl slotted the three-digit code into the lock. Zero, five, two, there that should do it. Batgirl thought as the lock recessed and the entire grate started to retract into the frame with a deafening squeal, made all the worse due to being underwater and thus seemingly omnidirectional. Once the noise did finally stop, Batgo carefully inspected the newly opened tunnel for new traps, but quickly decided it was an exercise in futility. If anything, the visibility had only gotten worse. But floating around the entrance was only burning through the time Ghost Spider could hold her breath. They had best get moving. Unfortunately, that was when their crocodile friend decided to make its reappearance. Batgirl turned her head just in time to see a massive shape appear in the gloom and the flash of teeth right where Ghost Spider was before both of them vanished into the tunnel, leaving Batgirl behind staring after them with wide eyes. She was swimming after them a second later, curses streaming through her mind. Oh! Okay, I was joking about the boots earlier, but if I keep getting attacked by giant reptiles, I'm going to dress up like an 80s country singer out of revenge. Ghost Spider complained even as she struggled to stop the crocodile's massive jaws from biting her in half. Her spider sense let her know the reptile was behind her, but her reflexes and a good bit of luck were the reason she managed to not do something stupid like impale her hand on a tooth. That didn't mean she wasn't in trouble, though. Being caught in the mouth of a crocodile and being dragged blindly underwater wasn't exactly smooth sailing. It only got worse as the creature started thrashing every once in a while, trying to dislodge her enough to bite down fully. And when the multi-ton animal decided that even that wasn't enough and started using the walls of the tunnel as weapons ghost spider knew she had to do something now or she was going to end up croc chow. Too bad that was easier said than done considering that unlike the last time she wrestled scaly, she currently had zero leverage, zero room to maneuver, and zero good ideas on how to change that. So it was a good thing that ghost spider did have a few bad ideas she could try out first. The first was attempting to kick at the croc's eyes, but that quickly turned out to be a bust. Ghost Spider was flexible, but no one with solid bones was flexible enough to pull that off. So after quickly abandoning that plan, she went to the next idea. Punching the thing unconscious from the inside of its mouth. Ghost Spider would be the first to admit this was not the greatest plan ever, but she also was starting to get lightheaded from holding her breath so long. She needed to get free and find air soon. With that in mind, she did her best to wriggle so that she was still braced against both jaws, but also had a hand free and cocked it back. A second later, her fist slammed into the comparatively soft palate of the croc's mouth, which turned out to be a bit of a mistake. Knocking something out with head trauma was more an art than science at the best of times. Trying to judge the correct amount of force to knock out a probably mutant crocodile and not accidentally put her fist through its skull while underwater and in its mouth was not the best of times. Ghost Spider's punch failed to knock the reptile out, and that meant it was free to do what came naturally to it after getting punched in the mouth, meaning it went absolutely berserk and started slamming into the sides of the pipe hard enough to dent metal. Ghost Spider held on for dear life, occasionally sneaking in another punch, until the croc finally smacked against the wall one too many times and something gave way. A sharp crunch echoed through the tunnel and the croc immediately stopped struggling, its jaws stopped pressing down around the wall crawler, and the massive creature just sort of floated off. Unmoving. A quick check revealed no heartbeat, no twitching, and a large amount of something leaking out of the croc's skull just barely visible in the dark water. Ghost Spider was instantly conflicted about the way everything ended. On the one hand, that had been a simple animal following its instincts and didn't deserve to die because of the Riddler's games. On the other hand, it had been trying very hard to kill her. All of that was secondary to the fact she was going to need to breathe soon, though. 
Ghost Spider was stuck in a fit of indecision as she debated whether it was better to backtrack down the pipe the croc had dragged her and hold out until she could get back to the surface that way, or keep going and hope there was an exit nearby. Thankfully, the decision was taken out of her hands by the swift arrival of Batgirl moments later, who was quick to temporarily lend her rebreather for a moment along with a light so Ghost Spider could finally see more than just some vague shapes in the dark. The first thing she noticed was the stuff leaking out of the crock wasn't red. Instead, it was dark black. Something that initially confused the heroine until she caught a glimpse of metal beneath the ruined skin. A quick check revealed a rather sophisticated robot frame. Ghost spider guessed that explained the unnatural size and behavior of the reptile. If it was mechanical, then it made sense why it was so aggressive when crocodiles were normally ambush predators. While she was investigating the robot, Batgirl had been checking out the walls of the tunnel. The thrashing that had broken the robot had also led to several cracks in the walls that were slowly leaking air bubbles, signaling a potential way out from the Riddler's death trap. Ghost Spider looked over to see her partner in this mess coating the edges of one of the bigger cracks with some sort of putty that foamed up even underwater before placing a detonator in it and signaling for both of them to back away. A flash and explosion later, both heroines were sucked out of the tunnel by the rushing water and fell a short distance before Ghost Spider managed to catch both of them with a web line. Note to self, get something for underwater adventures, cause that wasn't fun. Ghost Spider panted as she took in huge lungfuls of air. She wasn't going to take being able to breathe whenever she wanted for granted for at least a few weeks. Remind me after we get out of this and I'll lend you one of our spares. Batgirl muttered back. Ghost Spider looked at her and saw the redhead was tracing the tunnel to another massive container a short distance away. Disturbingly, there were a massive number of crossbows mounted on tracks surrounding the entire structure that clued the two of them into what the theme of the next challenge would have been if they hadn't created their own exit. Stolen from its original source, this story is not meant to be on Amazon. Report any sightings. I guess that would have been the woods section then. Batgirl mused, drawing Ghost Spider's attention. Section? What do you mean? Riddler's still keeping to the five elements theme. The sand was earth, the trap we skipped over looked like it was completely made from metal, and the last one was obviously water. If you take that into account and the cycle the elements go through, the next one should be wood. Batgirl explained. If you count wooden crossbow bolts anyway. Personally, Ghost Spider thought it took a bit more than that, but then again killer robot crocodile didn't scream, water, theme much better. Obviously, the Riddler was willing to sacrifice the theme a bit to make sure the two of them wouldn't be able to walk away from his death trap. So rather than get hung up on the madman's commitment to his own theme, she decided to focus on what was actually important. All right, so how do we find the Riddler before he realizes we're not stuck in his trap anymore? Batgirl brought a hand to her chin in thought. The best way would be to find something and track it back to his control room, but I'm not sure we'll be able to find something quickly enough. So my next thought is to try and predict where he's hiding out and head there directly, I'd guess either the middle of the facility where he's protected from all sides or the back from where we entered. The Riddler isn't really the type to risk himself if he can help it. Makes sense. Ghost Spider commented. He'd be in the middle if he's keeping to the Chinese theme, right? Isn't the middle of a formation usually a big deal? Batgirl shrugged. Maybe? I think it depends but I wouldn't put it past the Riddler to have a back way out just in case. Then we need to split up. How about... Oh! Where are they? Where are they? A figure in a green suit decorated with black question marks was muttering to himself as monitor after monitor in front of him changed to show different points of the intricate trap he had built. It had taken him some time to confirm that the two nuisances hadn't simply succumbed to his genius traps and had instead managed to escape. He had known they had somehow destroyed the drone that served as the main challenge of the area and was fully alert for any schemes for them to either escape back towards a previous area or continue ahead. But when there was no sign of them in either direction, he was forced to send one of the few minions he had on hand to investigate. Unfortunately, that took time and it wasn't until several minutes later that the minion had even found the hole in the passageway tunnel leaking water in one of the few unmonitored areas around, which meant the two pests could be almost anywhere by now. Edward Nigma was a genius beyond compare, an intellectual with few true peers, 
but even he was just one man and needed accurate information to plan his next move. And until he located the two rats running around outside his trap, he was quite unfortunately on the back foot for the moment. But only for the moment. Now then, how should I flush you two out into the open? He mused. A hand reached for one of the buttons that would enact his contingencies, only for a bat-shaped piece of metal to whistle through the air and pin the entire arm to the control panel by a sleeve. Batgirl, would you like to hear a riddle? Oh! Just as Batgirl expected, the Riddler did have some sort of command center in the middle of his trap. The only question that remained was if the villain was actually in there. Batgirl quickly maneuvered around the various sensors and cameras she could see around the structure and slipped into an air vent. Looking down into the inside, she saw a pair of hired thugs guarding the door into the command center and a figure sitting with their back to her on a large bank of monitors. A green sleeve was enough to tentatively confirm this was where she needed to be, though, so she slipped out of the vents with barely a sound and dropped on one of the thugs. He was unconscious almost immediately as his head hit the ground and his partner wasn't much better. Not after Batgirl ducked past a flailing arm and had him in a sleeper hold within seconds. A quick glance back at the figure by the monitors confirmed that the struggle had been quiet enough that the mastermind hadn't noticed, but Batgirl did see him reaching for a control of some sort. With no idea what that would unleash, she made a split-second decision to stop him by throwing a battering at his sleeve. It gave up the element of surprise, but at this point, she was confident in handling the Riddler head-to-head. -head. Batgirl, would you like to hear a riddle? Is it how many years you think you'll get for Grand Theft? Because I'm thinking 10 or 15 for this last scheme alone. Batgirl replied, alert for any tricks. Amusing, but no. What do the two of us have in common? It was a bad idea to give planners time to think or react, so Batgirl rushed at the seated figure and yanked it to face her, fully prepared to deck him in the face, only to pause when she came face to face with a doll-like mask instead of a person. We're both dummies. The Deca Riddler cackled from a speaker. You didn't think you could get the drop on me, did you? You may have blundered your way out of my traps, but let's see how you deal with something you cannot just brute force your way out of. A bright red 15 appeared in the middle of the dummy's face and started counting down. Batgirl's eyes widened in shock at the sight before she found herself sprinting from the control room almost before she realized it, grabbing the unconscious thugs by their collars and dragging them out with her on the way. She managed to slam the door shut just as the timer hit zero. There was a muted thump as the walls shook with the force of the explosion, but even after a few seconds that seemed to be it. Something that immediately made Batgirl suspicious. Okay, what's the trick I'm missing? She muttered to herself, looking around just to see another red timer in the distance hit zero and explode. The force of this explosion was much bigger than the previous one and ended up throwing the heroine to the ground. Batgirl pulled herself back up as fast as she could and immediately started looking around. Several more countdowns could be seen all throughout the facility. And if each of them was actually a bomb, there was enough to flatten the entire structure several times over. Oh, food dash. Another countdown hit zero followed by an explosion. Oh! Ghost Spider almost missed the hidden exit as she and Batgirl split up to try and tackle both scenarios about where the Riddler could be hiding. In fact, if it wasn't for several people suddenly running around, Ghost Spider would have simply gone right by it due to the lack of any kind of visible opening and low light. But a wall dropping away revealing a van was fairly eye-catching. So was the man in a green suit shouting orders at the top of his lungs. Get moving, all of you. The Bat Brat found the decoy center and the self-destruct is active. I want to be long gone from here before anyone else comes poking around. The spider-themed hero did a rough about face and latched onto one of the support pillars in the area to better watch the unfolding scene. A small group of minions were trying to rush loading the van with containers that probably had the stolen items from the days before, but they didn't seem armed. Probably because they weren't expecting to need to do much beyond move things around after the robberies themselves. Well, that just meant they were in for a bad time. Ghost Spider had also learned from the last time with the penguin and decided to target the getaway vehicle before she was revealed. Thick sheets of spider silk covered the doors to the van so that no one was getting it anywhere without either pushing it from behind or somehow tearing a hole in the cab. Damn, 
That other interfering pest is here also. One of you get that bin open. The rest, get her. Riddler ordered, even as Ghost Spider leaped into the middle of them. The first minion caught a fist to the jaw and went down like a sack of potatoes, but the others quickly got over the surprise of her sudden entrance and rushed to attack. Ghost Spider ducked a punch and Snap kicked a different minion in the chest before grabbing the first arm and Judo throwing him after the second. A third and final minion took the chance to tackle her to the ground, but Ghost Spider rolled with the impact. She managed to get her feet up to the man's chest and sent him flying with a powerful kick. Looks like you need better henchmen, Riddler. They aren't very good at getting things. She taunted, turning to the now scowling villain. I'll just have to do it myself then, he declared, charging her and swinging a cane topped with a bronze question mark like a baseball bat. Ghost Spider rolled to avoid the swing and went to sweet her opponent's feet, but the Riddler was actually more athletic than she was expecting. He jumped her own leg and stabbed at her multiple times with the cane, treating it almost like a rapier. You know, you're better at this than I, whoa. Expected. Ghost Spider commented after a particularly near miss. Hmph, it's only natural. I may not be one of those swollen Neanderthals, but learning how to be physically capable is simply good sense when dealing with the likes of Batman. I'm not sure if Batman beat enough common sense in you to think that, or knocked enough out that you think the best thing to do is learn to fight so you can keep committing crimes instead of, you know, not committing crimes. Riddler took a step back and twirled his cane dramatically. I don't expect you to understand the desires of an intellectual. Suddenly, several booms echoed through the area. Ah, uh, it seems like your friend is running out of time to escape. Red-rimmed eyes narrowed as Ghost Spider leaned forward aggressively. Then I guess I don't have more time to waste on you. With that said, Ghost Spider rushed forward and grabbed both the cane and the front of Riddler's suit with the intention of simply overpowering the man. But instead of ripping the cane out of his grip like she planned, only the black body of the cane moved at her tug, sliding away to reveal a thin blade that had been hidden in the body. One Riddler didn't hesitate to try stabbing her with. Ghost Spider mostly managed to get out of the way, but she hissed as the edge scraped along her ribs. In retaliation, she picked Riddler up by his suit and hurled him into the parked van, liberally covering him in webbing afterwards, and then quickly investigated the wound. Thankfully, it was a long but shallow cut so it wouldn't affect her much. More explosions sounded out and Ghost Spider knew she needed to get a move on if she wanted to make sure Batgirl was all right. Well, that was... Not fun, but it was interesting. Ghost Spider commented to the wriggling cocoon that was the Riddler. You boys hang around for a while. I'm sure the police would love to hear all about this. She couldn't make out the Riddler's muffled response through the webbing, but decided to take it as agreement. It wasn't like he was going anywhere soon. Now, she had a friend to find and possibly save. Oh! When the Riddler said self-destruct, he hadn't been kidding. Nearly everything in sight had been reduced to rubble. Ghost Spider was actually surprised the roof and warehouses above them hadn't collapsed yet, but she was sure it was just a matter of time. So she was extra careful where she swung, stepped, or jumped when backtracking just to make sure she didn't shift something and bring the building down on her own head by mistake or get caught in one of the explosions still going off all over the place. Spider. Over here. Ghost Spider's head snapped towards the shout and saw not only Batgirl, but also two more henchmen, unconscious, trapped between a wall of rubble and a fire that had started at some point. You all right? Ghost Spider asked when she jumped down to join them, wordlessly accepting one of the henchmen and looking for a good place to anchor a web line to pull them all out of the current situation. Mostly, Batgirl confirmed. A few explosions were close, but I was able to use a few taser batterings to short out some of the bombs. Managed to keep everything from collapsing on us at least. A large section of roof chose that moment to crash to the ground in the distance. For a little while anyway. Batgirl added. Ghost Spider nodded. Well, we were right about the Riddler's backdoor exit. I managed to catch him on the way out. So all we have to do is get out of here. Need me to take the second guy too. No, I got him. Just couldn't handle two dead weights at the same time. Batgirl replied, pulling out a grapple gun. Let's get out of here. I'm so done with today. Ghost Spider hummed in agreement. 
This wasn't what she had in mind when tracking down a robber.